What's going on everyone? Welcome back to Movie Emporium's TV review of Blade Runner Black Lotus. This episode will cover episodes 1 and 2 and are directed by Shinji Aramaki and Kenji Kamayama. Now before we begin, if you like this video, awesome, hit the subscribe button to join Movie Emporium, hit that notification bell top the funds coming next. If you like any of these videos, awesome, hit that like button as well as comment below on any video to watch, including this one. So here we are, we're talking of course Blade Runner Black Lotus, which is you know, based off the very famous franchise that is Blade Runner. It's a show that is about a woman who, you know, has lost her memory, has amnesia. We'll get into it in a second, you know, the first couple episodes. But as we know, Blade Runner was a uh, story that was created by Philip K. Dick, which was uh, called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep. It was very famously turned into a Ridley Scott movie that he directed in 1982, which was, of course, called Blade Runner. It was a financial and critical disaster, to be fairly honest. The fact that it became a cultural phenomenon is very similar to The Thing, which came out the same year, which really shows you that this kind of content is very ahead of its time. Not necessarily stuff that I really enjoy, because I you know, I'm going to be fairly honest, Blade Runner doesn't really do it for me when it comes to sci-fi, but I can't deny it in uh, 2001. And of course, you know, Star Wars are some of the most uh, influential sci-fi things, properties of all time. So it's gaining its cult status, it's gaining its popularity throughout the years, has had a couple animated shorts, uh, video games, all and so on and so forth. Very famously has a uh, sequel, which of course is directed by Denis Villeneuve, which is called Blade Runner 2049. So... To say this franchise has some staying power is an understatement. Now, with that said, um, the first two episodes of the series are going to premiere on uh, Adult Swim and Crunchyroll. They are going to, um, you know, do a week by week thing. So it'd be really interested in the thing to see. And so with that said, um, we're going to talk about the first two episodes. Uh, this review will not premiere till after the, those two episodes premiere. So I do hope you watch the episodes and come back and watch my review. But the first episode of Black Lotus, which is what I'm going to call the series, is called City of Angels. It's written by Eugene Sun. It is, in essence, a introduction to the world that is Blade Runner Black Lotus. We get the spinners. We get the Los Angeles dirty nature, you know, the rain and the climate problems and the, the small booths where they eat. It's very much a Japanese-inspired world in Los Angeles in a lot of aspects, which is really interesting because of the, you know, the, the look and feel of, like, the neon boards and the all the video footage that's being shown off those boards and whatnot. And it feels very much like a Blade Runner show, a Blade Runner property, which is really nice. Like I said, I love this world. I love the idea of just, you know, the the grays and blacks and how everything is nighttime for most of the part. And, you know, when you see like the big buildings, like you see in the background and stuff like that, they're filled with like smokestacks, you know, this place is with coal and all that stuff, you know, like I said, the climate control thing, but basically introduces us to this character named Ellie. Now, Ellie is an individual who can't remember anything has amnesia basically just everything about her life is just completely thrown out the window no idea what's going on she approaches a food booth like the one you see the harrison ford eating at in blade runner it's you know they have them all over the place the chef what's really interesting about this series is the chef and some of the characters don't speak english but there's no subtitles so you have no idea what they're saying which i don't know if it was a mistake of the screeners or something that they want to make more authentic but somehow l can kind of understand what she's saying you know she has some comprehension of it but she's trying to get somebody to help her to figure out what this is you know talk to someone and this, of course, is when she is, in essence, uh, pursued or stalked by these gang members who don't really have names in this episode or in this series. And she's cornered in an alley and she, in essence, is uh, taken down in a lot of physical punches and kicks and stuff like that. She tries to hold her own. And all of a sudden she has visions of something in the desert fighting some people i don't know exactly what's going on i don't really know much about the story so far because it's very vague which is fine because you want to keep it vague you want to make the story open up especially the flashback stuff open up as the story moves along she all of a sudden becomes a badass elite battle angel in a lot of aspects her like eyes like bright up and stuff like that and it was really cool i think the the strongest 
things about these this episode and these, this series so far is the action choreography um now we'll get into some of the negatives but the one thing i can definitely say that they do wholeheartedly awesome is the fact that when the fights happen there's several fights you know hand-to-hand combat fights and so on and so forth they're done in a way where the the shots are kind of static like one spot but the camera angle moves to the left to the right it kind of turns it does some really cool kind of uh interesting in digital photography that makes it like a really cool uh, up close very tense fight in its own right and just watching it play out it's similar to like old boy or the uh, daredevil tv show where it's just really cool really well choreographed you can tell these directors have a really cool concept of what they want and they make the animation work even though it's very stilted in a lot of places and it feels cool it feels you know fun and energetic it feels like a very anime style fight but does it in a really nice kind of chaotic manner and of course she takes down the bad guys and they run away or they chase after her or whatever and and here we're actually reintroduced to uh, Doc Badger from Blade Runner 2049, who is once again played by uh, Barkhad Abdi. Uh, really cool to see him in the episode. Uh, whether he does a really nice job in the series is a different story, but it's kind of cool to see him in, you know, returning as a character we know from a, a previous movie. So he offers her kind of um, a, a place to hide out. She needs help from him because he is an individual who, you know, is a techie type of you know character that can break into things. But he, at first, is very apprehensive. And then he's like, here's what I'll do. Or she, she's like, here's what I'll do for you. You help me get into this machine and I will make sure the bad guys never bother you again. So he agrees to this and she takes a, a katana, a samurai sword. They call it samurai sword, it's a katana, whatever you want to call it. And she goes back to the guys, and I'm assuming this show is rated M for mature because the sword fighting, the sword play with the katana or samurai sword is absolutely graphic. Um, it does what anime does when it comes to sword play and sword fighting, where it's just like cutting people and you see blood squirting now. And at the point where she's taking down most of the bad guys, the main leader points a gun at her, threatens her, so on and so forth. And um, she is able to move out of the way of the bullets as he's shooting them. And uh, she stabs him in the part that men don't like to be hit or stabbed in. And you know what I'm talking about. And it's very, very graphic, very bloody. And uh, the guy dies. So that's pretty much the gist. And um, once again, very cool fight sequence. Very well choreographed. Very intriguing and interesting. You know, it's, it's still kind of a mystery of who this girl is. It's just a really cool kind of conceptual idea that really is really funny the kind of justification for the show's look and feel compared to what they do with the action sequences which i thought was kind of interesting but what this does is it takes her to a moment that we see at the beginning of the episode where she jumps into a truck and she's like i forget who i am and she kind of remembers a little bit more she's with a friend and she's fighting some people and that's kind of like where it leaves off well in essence, this episode ends with Doc going, I can't activate the device. It's you know, code encrypted. She gets really mad. But he's like, I have somebody that can help you named Jay. I think it's the Jason character or whatever. And they take she and Doc takes her up to Jason's apartment or Jay's apartment. And the guy is drunk. He is, has a bottle in his hand. And he is... Um, left the episodes left in a cliffhanger of what's going to happen next you know because that's where the episode ends so in essence it's just an introduction it gives us a cool action couple action sequences there's no real kind of uh clarification on what's going on which i'm fine with episode ones can do whatever they want my problem overall with this episode is probably going to be the overall problem with the entire series is the look, I know anime is very unique in its animation style. I know it has very different kind of uh, feels and what people do and how they animate it and how they animate the background. This show, in its nutshell, in the first episode, is gorgeous to look at in a background level. The city, the spinners, the neon, all that stuff is fantastic to look at. Really gives the city in this universe a great pop. Really feels like Blade Runner. But... The characters themselves 
feel very similar to the Final Fantasy Spirits Within characters, or maybe some of the recent uh, animated series, anime episode shows or movies with Resident Evil, where there is a plastic feel to the characters. There is a stiffness to the characters' movement. There's kind of a uh, there's a um, you know the valley situation where their eyes aren't really feeling like they're there. There's just there's an ugliness to the characters themselves. It's just everything how they talk, how they walk. You know they have some a list actors in this. You know and on top of that the episode moves so quickly that you're just kind of at odds with what is even going on which i said first episode i can forgive that but if it continues in the next two episodes i'm gonna have a problem and i may get to the point where i may not continue the series but what the series also does that i do like is it's a little less convoluted than the blade runner movie itself it's a little easier to follow it has some interesting ideas about who l is is she a replicant is she not a replicant and i found it just very conflicting in its overarching nature but i still found it very intriguing so so leaving off on the first episode before i continue on to the second episode i would probably give this like a seven and a half out of ten just on a aesthetic level and a story level I think it has some interesting concepts it could continue with. And like I said, we'll get into, you know, the next episode. But if I were to end it here with not knowing anything else, with not knowing the other two episodes, I probably would have given it a lower score. But as of right now, I'm giving it a seven and a half out of ten. So on this episode, seven and a half out of ten. So the next episode is called uh All We Are Not, which is written by Alex D. Campy. And this episode continues literally right after the the ending close and credits for the first episode. Doc and Ellie are trying to wake up Jay or Jason, whatever you want to call him. Ellie pours liquid on Jay, which definitely wakes him up. And we're introduced to a guy who is apparently really good at what he can do. He is a, you know, uh, a hacker, one of those types of individuals. And he at first refuses to mess with this black box. He refuses to help him. And some reason he kind of changes his mind because anime shows have this really weird kind of, you know, idea and concept of like characters changing their ideas and ideologies like that quickly without real like logic and reason. But he hooks up the, the black box to the computer computer and says the files are locked it'll take him a while to break and so on and so forth it's very typical it's very atypical we know we need to have some kind of plot story so on and so forth to move forward so we need those kind of um those uh, walls to hit before we can continue well this episode is not really about much of the black box it's actually about ellie trying to figure out who she is so on the TV, we're introduced to, of course, Wallace Sr. and Bannister. Wallace Sr., of course, is uh, Brian Cox's character. The Bannister character is played by Greg Henry. And basically, this is about she actually is going to pursue Bannister because she has uh, an inkling, uh, almost like deja vu type of situation where she feels like she knows the guy or seen the guy before. And so she goes to this place called the Pick Fair Hotel, which is where Bannister's at, and she then chases him to a specific location. Well, on top of everything, we're introduced to a detective named Milani Davis, but her character's introduced, similar to like what Ellie's introduced, where she uh, talks to a suspect in the food thing, the food cart or whatever. She chases after him and arrests him, so it's just kind of that cool introduction to the character. But we see... Um, Ellie's character approached the bouncers outside this, I guess it's a boxing arena of some sort. It seems like a black market type of boxing arena, but she walks in, she takes down some guards. We see a boxing match happen. We find out these boxing, these boxers are of course replicants and she confronts Bannister about everything about who she is, what she is, why she's here, why she know Bannister and Bannister's like, you're a replicant you were made a week ago and this causes her to beat him up and he's very good at fighting her back what's really interesting is she starts having visions of banister in a sporting a hunting sporting event where they are shooting and killing replicants and of course ellie is one of those people so they've wrangled up all wrangled up all these replicants and basically are shooting them, which is really disturbing. The whole idea of hunting and like you've seen like the hunt or that Eli Roth like torture porn film, the hostel or whatever it is, it's causes her to be very angry, it causes her to be really upset. She gets the upper hand of of course uh, Bannister's character, and she basically chokes him out she chokes him to death and he falls over and dies and it was really weird to watch that segment because the fact that he 
fell to his death is not surprising. It's how how the crowd reacted, which was really weird. At first, they're like, oh, I'm scared. And then they just don't really react to it much anymore, which feels like a, an animation problem. It feels like the animation was really weirdly done. And I don't know. It was really strange. But one of the boxers gets knocked out. And, of course, Alani Davis is called to this murder you know situation at the arena she goes there and they're looking for a young 20 year old woman who caused the death and really 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 strange stuff what's also strange about that is she sees ellie walking out she approaches ellie and she sees the black lotus uh tattoo on her back and she doesn't really do anything which is strange. Why is she not doing anything? What is the purpose of her just walking the other direction, looking for a suspect? Does she know anything about this Black Lotus? Are we not, we're not being told anything about this Black Lotus? Which is some stuff in episode three that talks about, you know, how she got the tattoo. But there's something going on here with this whole idea of the Black Lotus or what it is, why it represents this, 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 and this. And it was really strange. I didn't really understand what was going on with that. But of course, she's chased by the police. They go after her. She somehow scares a wall that's really tall and really she does a really nice job of doing that and she's in an alleyway now and the spinners are coming after her the police spinners and so on and so forth the flying vehicles and she has more of that vision of that hunt that situation that happened she like freaks out and then uh she sees jason who shoots her and she that's the end of her uh, end of her character for the episode. But there's also a thing where we are introduced to Wallace's son, uh, Neander Jr., who's played by Wes Bentley, and he and his father have a talk. He, the father learns about the the death of Bannister, how they just met, and there's some like things that are going to happen in episode three that really explain that character. But once again, like I said, this is a continuation of episode two, or I'm sorry, episode one. It's a little bit better in its kind of concept. I mean, it's still. The characters are poorly animated, which is really bothersome. The world is cool. There's that really weird segment at the boxing arena. But I don't know if this series is holding its own weight, to be fairly honest. It feels like they're trying to set up a lot of mystery boxes, but they're not giving us a lot of information at this point from episode two to really justify what is going on in this world. Yes, we're introducing new characters, but we need more to what's going on it's just it's really weird i don't get what's going on sometimes i'm guessing at this point when i was watching this that the reveals are going to come in either if there's a second season or if it's just this first season we're going to get in like five or six episodes what exactly is going on so this episode on its own i'm giving an 8 out of 10 because it is much much better than the first episode does give us new characters a little more you know the piece of the puzzle but introduces us to much more mystery boxes on what's going on so and so yeah that's where we're gonna leave it for right now with uh episode two and episode one premiering on this date um overall like i said it needs more it needs more content it needs more justification for what it's doing it really needs an animation update, which is not going to have, unfortunately. But I think for a Blade Runner property, a Blade Runner thing, a show or whatever you want to call it, it does do an interesting, fun job of, you know, enhancing and expanding this world that I really find fascinating. Like I said, I love the world building. I'm just not a real big fan of the character or, uh, animation or the dialogue that's being spewed out and stuff like that. So it's a problem. Probably not going to be fixed. So overall, it's just you have to deal with what you have to deal with. But, you know, a seven and a half out for the first episode, eight for the second episode is not bad. Still, you know, pretty good review. So and so with that said, that'll be my take on the first and second episode of Blade Runner Black Lotus. Uh, in the comments below, what is your overall take on the kind of introduction to this series? I don't know if it's going to be like a season one, two, three, four, all that type of thing, or if it's a limited series. Did you enjoy it? Are you looking forward to the next few episodes? What is your overall take? Where do you think the series is going? All that good stuff. But otherwise, if you like what you see on this channel, hit the subscribe button to join Movie Emporium. Hit that notification bell at the top to find what's coming next. If you like any of the videos, awesome. Hit that like button. And as always, we'll see you guys on the next video. Peace out.